I think the other thing I probably, you know, learned from Freaks and Geeks is exactly what you talked about, where um, <clears throat> you said you cast everybody and then wrote it around them. And it's like, I think a trap I could, you know, maybe fell into early on writing is like, uh, I want to write kind of to an idea or something like that rather than work with what's there. And you, and you know, and you can get much more energy yeah. if you do it that way. Especially, I mean, especially I think in our case, because you're dealing, you were dealing with younger actors. Yeah. And so if you just go with who they are and their strengths, yeah. you're going to get the absolute best out of them. I think at the time when we did Freaks and Geeks, we thought that you were really interesting. We thought the whole cast was interesting. But we probably thought you were more interesting than you thought you were. Really? So you seem to be reaching to make things oh, more right, interesting. Right, right, right. And we used to laugh because James would always like look for a prop or something like right, that. Right. In this scene, I want to eat a snowball. A whole scene. <laughs> I want to like, eat the sunflower seeds. Or he'd be like looking for business. And we would always be like, and I, why yeah, does I he actually, eat business? He does, he's, he's awesome. But, but it was almost like embarrassment of just being in your own skin. Yeah. Uh, which I, I think as a writer, I didn't know what I wanted to do until I was in my 30s. So when someone's very young, and we're like, no, you need to do nothing. Like, right. It's already there, but you right. don't actually right. know yourself. I totally agree. And, and it literally was a snowball. <laughs> and I ate the damn snowball. Even when the camera was on me, I probably ate about 10 snowballs. Yeah, when the camera wasn't on you. <laughs> like I, I just all did. camera snowball. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a mistake when you want to eat food in a scene and you forget you're going to have to do 25 takes. <laughs> and a snowball is not something you want to eat 25 <laughs> Well, the one time I was... They don't even know what a snowball is. It's just a ball of sugar goo. Yeah. It's one of those things that after like... the apocalypse, it would still be standing there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I did, yeah, I ate a lot of those. And the one time I was ever bulimic, was Jason and I had some scene where we thought it would be cool if we ate donuts. And we ended up eating like yeah. 20 donuts. <laughs> and he and I went up to our dressing rooms and, and threw it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> remember that story. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but uh, there's, the, there's, a, there's a, a section in the book where uh, someone uh, is criticizing you for the book in the book. <laughs> but how is that for you to write? Um, I mean, part of you know, part of what it is uh, the book is is doing is trying to give a sense of what it's like to be in kind of the public sphere, I guess, and so. As an actor, and not and I'm not asking for pity or anything, just kind of give an impression. And so as an actor, you know, you are perceived through your roles. You know, people will read into your everyone thinks I'm a pothead. You know. <laughs> James is not a pothead. A lot of people think I'm a <laughs> And, you know, uh, a lot of kids come up to me and say, wow, your arm grew back, you know? And, <laughs> Um, so you're perceived through your characters, um, you're perceived through your interviews, um, there are uh, magazine articles written about you, but that's kind of filtered through somebody else, you know, writing about you. Um, um, just your image, you know, is on the internet, cut and pasted, you know, you know thousands of times, whatever. But when you do that many different things, it's hard for people to get a handle on you. Mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, for what you do, is probably a great thing, but you might be playing a stoner guy in Pineapple Express, and then you're in Milk, and then you're in the Gucci ad, yeah. and it's all, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's so many different masks that, well, part that of, you can't get a handle on it. Like, I look at some of it, and I, I wonder what your, what, like, what, your, what your intention is, but like, for me, is I only think of things as comedy. So I think right. everything you're doing is an elaborate joke. <laughs> <laughs> like when I see a Gucci ad, I just think, I just look in your eye, I think he thinks this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> but you may love Gucci, and, and you look amazing. I wouldn't look like that in a Gucci ad. Uh, that doesn't happen. But, uh, 
whether it's a joke or not, it's obviously selling cologne. Yeah. So it's doing it's doing its job. But sometimes it feels like uh, that uh, in all these things that you're doing, um, that it's almost like it's all one art project. Yes and no. Um, <clears throat> Is it all curiosity? Like, I heard you on the radio, and you were being interviewed, and the woman says, what have you not done that you would like to do? And you said, I'd like to write a play, and I'd like to do what you do. I'd like to be an interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow. It's fun interviewing them. I love it. I, and and that, it is a great thing to do. And I, and I thought, there, well, there's probably nothing you don't want to do, <laughs> which is great. And the fact that you do it, it does take, I mean, I don't think anyone in the audience can ever understand the courage it takes on top of just your curiosity level, to do things. Most people don't really do things. But is it on some level all part of one conceit, or are you just separately actually interested? Right, so um, it's both, right? So when I um, am hired to do a certain thing, I wanna, I wanna do that thing, you know, I wanna perform my job. Like the way my attitude shifted, one of the things that shifted um, in my perspective what, around the time of Pineapple Express is I started looking at movies and, and television as, um, or particularly in movies, as a director's medium. And that made me relax as an actor, that I didn't need to control that thing. Yeah. I'm being hired to do a specific job and I, and that job is to play the character and help that director achieve his or her vision. And it made me a much better actor because now I'm in line with everything. I'm fitting in with the yeah. project. I'm not off doing something that is going to conflict with yeah. whatever everyone else is doing. And, um, and so when I'm hired as an actor, I want to do that job. I don't want to, you know, you know, the wink that you're reading into the Gucci thing you're reading, you're, you're reading that, because you know, when they ask me to do something, I'm going to pose like they yeah. want me to pose. <laughs> I'm not going to try and be like, you know, put the slaw smile or whatever. Like, I just never believe that anybody, regardless if they're handsome or not handsome, can act handsome. <laughs> you know, like to own your handsomeness without irony is weird to me. Even sexy women, like if a girl's like, hmm, I think... It's weird to be comfortable doing that and not think this is saying crazy. I'm comfortable doing it. Yeah. I'm just saying no, I'm just they're paying me to do a certain yeah. thing and I'm going to try and deliver it. Yeah. <laughs> so, within the projects, like, you know, when I go and, you know, I'm hired to, you know, one of Iris's movies that she likes to have done is Oz. When I'm hired to do Oz, I'm not going to try and wink at the audience and say, hey, this is James Franco. <laughs> I'm going to go and try and be Oz. But um, that doesn't mean that um, just because I'm playing Oz, like I won't go and do Spring Breakers right after that. <laughs> and then they come out and like, oh, And it's like the you know, juxtaposition kind of makes it like crazy, yeah. like, Wow. But you're getting away with it. This is what I find so fascinating. <laughs> is our culture is so cruel to people. And the one thing you learn the second you get on Twitter or anything is if like, you say anything, first of all, everyone goes, white man's problems. <laughs> you get that? You know, like, people just are mad at you if, uh, you know, your life is okay. Uh, which I understand. Uh, uh, but, um, but, it but, but people are kind of rough on people who, who do things that are different. You know, Tom Hanks plays a killer in Road to Perdition. People are like, oh, you, you don't kill people? You're not allowed to do that? Uh, and so to do that, and I think because so much of the work is so strong, the fact that you somehow train people to say, this is what I do, and like any idea of uh, resistance is over, because it keeps getting there's certain benchmark projects that people are so taken with, like 127 hours, that people have decided to root you on in this quest, where usually they kill people for, for, for this kind of thing. Right, so um, I think what you were talking about earlier too is to actually just try and do it. I knew, like, okay, I'm gonna, the people are gonna be very skeptical, and I'm gonna be, you know, as they should be, you know, because because actors 
have what they have is, you know, or at least actors like me have, have a certain level of celebrity. And so people are skeptical that, that an actor will use that celebrity to gain inroads into areas that they don't deserve to be in, right? People don't do two things well. <laughs> Bill Clinton isn't a good saxophone player. <laughs> But I mean, what, one of the things that you showed me or what Seth showed me is like, there's like this whole other brand of, you know, performers and creators who are doing everything. Yeah. And it was like, I was like really jealous. So I was like, oh, I, I was just, I kind of came up just as the actor. And you gave, and then after Freaks and Geeks, Seth got this whole kind of training in writing and, and then this certain kind of improvisational acting and all of that and it was like boom he comes out and he's like this three dimensional thing and it's awesome because it's like a, a performer who gets to own everything and not in a control way more you know in not in that oh he gets to actually control everything it's more like he gets to be involved in everything he gets to collaborate on all levels and I was, you know, very envious of that, but it also showed me, like, oh, yeah, it, it, it can be done. It's that, but it's still, like you're saying, it's still kind of in the world of comedy, and so it, I guess it's kind of accepted. If you go out and, you know, write a book or do, you know, an art show or something, it's like, yeah, it's kind of danger. Like, maybe you're not allowed to do that. The fact is, you know, in the world of, you know, contemporary art, like this, these ideas of, you know, using, you know, multiple forms and, and a, the idea that a painter can go make a video is not crazy. Yeah. It's just that it's because I started in the film world and the TV world, that's where the skeptic skepticism comes in. But, but, you're but the book is a, is a great example of what, one of the things I try and do is, I like Having, having one thing and then reframing it with another form or medium. And so here's a book about performance, and it's almost a weird performance in itself, but it's a book, right? Because you called me one day and you said, can I have all the dailies from Knocked Up? <laughs> no, no, no. Was it Knocked Up? No. Freaks. Oh, oh, he wanted all the dailies from Freaks and Geeks, all the footage, and he wanted to just cut something else out of it. Yes. <laughs> you didn't give it to me. Well, I couldn't. I wasn't allowed to give it to you. Uh, but you did wind up doing that with, with another project. Were you able to do that? Right. So um, it's a uh, good example. So I uh, worked with Gus Van Sant on Milk. And um, when, we, when that movie came out, we had premieres everywhere in San Francisco, New York, and L.A. And he wanted to do a premiere in Portland and he couldn't get any of the other actors to go, and he knew I was obsessed with my own private I know he said, if you come, I'll give you a tour of all the places we shot that movie. I was like, all right. <laughs> and then at the end of the tour, he said, I, you know, I kept all the dailies from that movie. Oh and that was made in, you know, the early 90s, so it was still on film, you know. And I was like, oh my God, we have to watch these things. So I made another trip to Portland and we sat for two days and just watched all the dailies and it was, to me it was amazing because it was like my favorite movie and you know it was like River Phoenix like giving his best performance and you just get to see, it was like there wasn't a minute that was boring to me. And as we were sitting there watching it, we started talking about like how Gus's movies had, you know, his editing style had changed because he, had, you know, had made Elephant around that time and Last Days and Jerry and was, you know, doing this new thing with like very long takes and minimal cuts. And we started talking like, well, what if you had made this movie now? Like, oh, look at this shot. Yeah. You could just stay on that shot. You don't need to cut. And and he's like, you know, uh, sitting here watching this is like this is what you do when you get ready to cut a movie, and it's making me want to recut this movie. And so I was like, oh. <laughs> and and, and um, he, but he's like, well, but it's all on film. We'd have to digitize it, and that costs a lot of money, and I do not have money to put in a project like this. So I was, oh, and I was 
nothing. So I went to I went to Gucci and I said, Gucci, will you sponsor this project? Yeah. If you do, I'll look extra sexy. <laughs> They're, I mean, that's one of the reasons I love Gucci yeah. is they're so supportive of these artistic projects. And I went to the Gagosian Gallery and I said, would you be interested in the show with you know, me and Gus if we came up with this? And they're like, yeah. And so I went back to Gus. I said, it's financed. And, and then I said, <clears throat> uh, if it's digitized, um, could I have my own copy of the material and maybe cut something together? And if you hate it, I swear I will, we can destroy it and I'll never show it to anybody. So he said, yes, probably think, thinking, I'm going to have to tell James, he can't show us, that, you know, think anybody. And I cut a version together, you know, with certain kind of um, uh, guidelines in mind. Like, it was almost as if I was playing, as I was editing, like, in my head, I was like, Gus, now, editing it now. Did you cut the whole, uh, whole version of the movie? I cut a new version of the movie, but... Um, I took out all the, shake, there's like Shakespeare stuff in there. And I took all of that out and I just focused on River Phoenix's character. And um, it's kind of this amazing thing. And, it, and, um, and we're going to show it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> but it was, I loved it because it was a piece that came out of, you know, the material that was intended yeah. for something else. And so I love that I I love the idea of doing it with freaks and geeks because it was like with with Idaho, you know, as soon as I had that in, in the in my computer in the editing program, it was like weird. Because I loved that movie since before I started acting, so it was like almost like the fabric of my childhood daydreams like there in front of me. Like me cutting the jerk. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine? Like, it, it crazy. And, and so I thought, oh, with Freaks and Geeks, wouldn't that be interesting because I'm in it now. It's also based on high school. And although in a lot of ways I, I wasn't like Daniel in high school, in some ways I was. You know, I did get in a fair amount of trouble. And so it would be personal on a lot of levels, and me, me performing, but yeah. also sort of about me, yeah. you know? No, you still can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask them. They all, yeah, that'd be cool, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 New version of Freaks and Geeks. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to take some questions uh, here. Does anybody have a, a question for James? Um, what, what is the um, book or novel that, that you would most like to adapt? What is you the book or novel you'd most like to adapt? A book or novel I'd most like to adapt. Well, I've, I've um, I've done four now, uh, maybe, f maybe even six. Uh, I did Hart Crane's life based on a book called The Broken Tower. I did um, The Last Day of Salmonio's life based on a biography of Salmonio. I did As I Lay Dying by Faulkner. I did Child of God by uh, Cormac McCarthy that will be out probably early next year. I did um, a movie about Charles Bukowski's uh, childhood. It's not really based on him on Rye, it's more based on his biography. And then uh, I just shot uh, Sound of the Fury by Faulkner. So I guess I could say those are the ones I'd like to adapt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, recently, I just, you know, I'm doing a biopic, and I'm You heard I was doing one? Well, you wrote about it. it oh, I wrote about it. Oh, yeah. right. And I was just wondering if that is a central theme for Catcher in the Rye, some of the books that you're, you're in adolescence and adolescence, and what they're expressing to in, in that mindset. Basically, has Catcher in the Rye been a big influence on me? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's just one of the great books, and I remember um, Paul gave every every person in the cast of Freaks and Geeks yeah. that book when we started, because it was uh, uh, very important to him, too. Um, yeah, I mean, you look at that book, I, Judd's actually in the documentary about... Uh, yeah. Then I got cut out. No, no, you're in it. No, they, like, they, they did a recut, and then they cut me out. <laughs> that funny? Since the version I saw in they the did, theater? They did, they released it in like, a few theaters, 
and then Harvey went in and cut like another like eight minutes out. Yeah, we went, don't want Jeff. He went straight to the, the Jewish guy. What are they thinking? What's that? What are they thinking? What are they thinking? Cut you out? They just got enough. I didn't. I, didn't, I never saw it with me. Who's the money? How I look? You look great. You said. I, I even remember what you said. Like. You remember going through the book looking for good lines that you would underline, and you realize you just underlined the whole book. It really was crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, and that, and one of the great things about that book is voice. You know, the way that he uses, you know, a teenager's kind of slang, but through that can kind of discuss very deep issues. And one of the one of the theories of, of um, Shane Salerno and David Shields, who, who worked on the documentary and, and wrote the book about Salinger, is that that book is actually about uh, PTSD or somebody that suffered, you know, trauma going through a war, but it's masked as, you know, kind of a coming of age novel. Um, so on the surface, you get the voice of a teenager. But underneath is kind of this great depth and trauma that's trying to be, you know, that he's trying to heal in a way. So I like that. I mean, I like using one thing um, that's seemingly simple or, you know, um, speaking in kind of uh, 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 young person's vernacular, but is dealing with deeper and bigger, you know, almost adult issues, more universal issues. Um, so as far as acting goes, do you feel that you enjoy playing villainous characters more? Because I feel like after Spider-Man and, and, and Spring Breakers and then the new one coming up, I think, oh, Jason. <laughs> on front. But you're such a good, you're such a great good guy, I don't know. But I like, I like all I played Oz. I was not. I mean, I guess I didn't make it into heaven in this is the end. <laughs> I was still a good guy. I just didn't like Danny in the movie. And then, um, no, I mean... What does that say that Seth thought you wouldn't make it to heaven? I, I mean, I, I... That was, I think, the one bad thing about that movie. Is that <laughs> I wasn't in heaven. I think they would have made like $10 million more dollars if I was in heaven. <laughs> How does Jane Baruchel get into heaven? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but no, I mean, I, I no, I'm, I'm playing all different kinds of characters. How do you guys go about uh, getting into your like creative headspace? Do you have any like, processes, anything like that? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'd love to hear Judd's answer too. Uh, I, uh, I mean, it kind of depends on what it is, but um, I don't know. I guess with acting, uh, I've done it enough now where I feel like. Uh, you know, there's certain there's preparation you do beforehand if there's a character that's sort of outside of your natural behavior, but it's something that I just feel <clears throat> very comfortable just kind of jumping in and doing. And, and um, the key for me there is just being relaxed, actually. So I just try and be relaxed whenever I act. Um, and then uh, writing, um, I just listen. I just listen to music and. I kind of, I can, if I do that, I can kind of be anywhere. I don't need like a shrine or a special.